Hello and welcome to the Clara Therapist channel. I'm Richard Simon. Today I'm covering the AWS Summit in London. So let's dive in and see what's happening. This is a summary review of the AWS Summit held in London in 2022. This was the first in-person AWS Summit in London since the pandemic and lockdowns. Many visitors I spoke with were excited to be back in person and could meet AWS staff and vendors face to face. With over 8,000 visitors, over 80 talks and demos, and about 100 partners, this was a great opportunity to explore the AWS ecosystem. There were so many talks and so many tracks, it would not be possible for me to do them all justice here. But this should serve as a good overview of the summit and some of the talks and things that caught my eye while I was there. Werner Vogels, the AWS CTO, was not present at the summit, but the local leadership stepped up to deliver the keynotes with the likes of Darren Hardman and Matt Wood. The most interesting customer story came from Kazoo, the online car retailer, a very impressive set of stats, which included Kazoo's business runs entirely in AWS Lambda, so completely serverless. Their website was up and running and taking customer orders in 90 days from the moment the company started trading in 2019. Their revenues have reached over 700 million pounds and they are looking to expand into the rest of Europe and North America. I also had the chance to speak to some of the AWS partners that were on the show floor at the summit. I particularly wanted to ask them to provide their definitions of certain industry-wide technologies and terms their explanation for each, and what the terms meant to them particularly. This was a good opportunity to summarize some of the technologies and solutions on offer at the summit. We will see how they did throughout this review. And here's one from Harness to start us off. Hello, so I'm back again here uh, with Harness right now, and I'm talking to uh, Jordi, uh, and we're going to go through some of the uh, definitions that Harness has uh, for all their solutions, which are really quite cool because uh, they tend to kind of use uh, a lot of the technology uh, and industry names that everybody recognizes. So Jordi, let's uh, start with uh, continuous integration. What is a continuous integration? So just to frame a bit the conversation, Harness is a complete end-to-end -end platform. The base of it are the two first module, so CI, Continuous Integration, and CD. And on top of that, you've got the remaining modules uh, that build value on top of it. But to your point, Continuous Integration is the beginning of the journey to any software delivery pipeline. So it's the uh, module that helps uh, build software, compile, test, and, and integrate easier, those things. So it allows every company to go faster. Uh, just to build packages, images, the software itself, the de deliverable. The next module, continuous delivery, is the one that is taking care of that to take it to the end user. So whether whether uh, the software is running in Kubernetes or any other infrastructure or platform, uh, uh, CD will take care of it. It will roll back any any faulty uh, deliveries and so forth. There's plenty of functionality. It's actually the leader in the category. Uh, our our CD uh, module is the leader leader in the. CD category, as you said, uh, the names of the modules are very self-explanatory and they are category names in a way. And those, are, those two combined make the whole platform basic experience. On top of that, and if you want, we can move on. Yeah, and so the feature flags? So feature flags is this progressive delivery, modern way of delivering software by which uh, you will just uh, uh, not keep uh, features unreleased or uh, actually you will not need to schedule your releases because you can have features on your code base ready to be rolled out any minute. You will just have to toggle them on and off. And you can toggle them on for certain segments of the audience, of the traffic, of the users, and certain other segments not not be able to see it, right? And you can test and A-B test and so forth. So that's the 
again, the progressive delivery, uh, yeah, progressive rollout, feature flag management module that helps just just deliver software very progressively and in a in a way that there's no uh, that allows you to be confident with the tests you're running and then rolling out m uh, massively the adoption of certain features. Excellent. Can I just ask you just to come in a little bit? There we go. Excellent. Yes. Um, so that's the feature flags and what's the cloud cost management? I really like that one because I think I spoke to actually you guys about it a while back, but I think it's quite cool. So I'd I'd love to yeah kind of just you know get get your definition on that. That's the module that. So we are here in AWS um, um, Summit, London, and it's the, it's the module that the AWS people are not so happy about. But let's face it, I mean, um, the, the cloud, AWS, GCP, it's extremely convenient. I mean, these behemoths are not growing at the rates they are growing. They're not making such amount of money out of nowhere. They are solving a massive problem. Now, having said that, it's so convenient that you, your, your invoices might get a bit wild. Uh, we all get, you know, if we start eating fast food, we might get a bit fatter than we want, uh, be, and, but it's the convenience of fast food, right? Um, I'm not equating the two things, by the way. But in any case, so that, this module is the, the module that will allow our clients to take really good care of, the, of, of optimizing their costs, right, to detect spikes uh, in, in, product, in, in memory usage, in, in the basic three compu um, uh, compute pr uh, primitives that the cloud will, will provide, compute, networking, and storage. And with that module on, you will be able to, well, make sense of, of the cost, uh, um, of the different cost uh, measurements, but also take care of the, of the actual invoice, right, to make sense of it and, and to keep it under control all the time. Excellent. That's certainly one of my favorite uh, subjects. So, on to service reliability management. So, these last two are the, mo the most recent ones. We just released them uh, a few weeks ago. So, SRE basically is the, this, this category that Google, like many others, by the way, uh, pioneered is the way in which sites, websites, or services that are running live should be running live all the time, or at least have this, the, the, the highest uptime possible, right? So there's certain skills and certain techniques to keep those things running without any hiccups or downtime at all, uh, even with rollouts, with rollbacks, with and so forth. So that's the module that will take care of all those super advanced features that will allow to have 99.9999% uptime. Uh, like any Google site has, right? I, I, I'm sure you don't remember the last time Gmail was down, because probably that was ages ago, and that's because these guys master SRE. Uh, so we're trying to encapsulate that knowledge, not only from Google, but you know through the industry, in this skill set, in this feature set, uh, that we're calling uh, SRE. And it's, it's, it's fairly advanced, to be honest, but we're making developer experience one of our main, um, the, of the main assets in the whole platform, and it's easy to use. Excellent. And the final one, what else have you got to say about that? So that's a bit of an add-on to continuous integration. As I mentioned, continuous integration is mostly focused on the ability to uh, build software, to package it, and to run tests. But I didn't mention that of the complete set of te of, the, of the complete suite of tests, probably the most important su uh, subset of those are security tests. And we've packaged that independently in STO, so it's a uh, an add-on, if you wish, a module, a separate module that is focused only on security tests, right? On running security tests, on being able to plug in other security services that are some of them are present in this uh, fair, in this in this uh, summit. And, uh, and making the security testing uh, reporting and analysis way more flexible than it is out of the box. Excellent. Well, Jordi, I appreciate your time and thank you for going through all of those. It's been great to have all those uh, defined clearly. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Again, thank you. Thank you for your interest. Now, there were a number of themes to the actual summits. Um, so I'll read out uh, just a few of those that were of interest to me. In the uh, theme around cloud operations, there was a couple of talks there. One was called uh, Control, Manage and Optimize AWS Costs. So again, a sort of whole cost thing and FinOps being um, you know, playing a pivotal role there. And the other one was called uh, the Building Blocks of Cloud Ops, an interesting term. Uh, in the databases theme, uh, a couple of the talks caught my eye. Uh, so one of those was migrate your database to AWS with ease. And the other one was uh, break free from your old database and start your data modernization journey. 
easy to compute theme was quite busy as well uh, so as a uh, talk around what's new in EC2 uh, and also one around uh, the HPC space which is called discover the full power of HPC on AWS uh, now there was a live demo of spinning up an HPC cluster um, and that included a number of um, uh, AWS technologies in the EC2 space including the AWS uh, parallel cluster uh, elastic fabric adapter, uh, as well as a demonstration of the various uh, EC2 instances available uh, in the HPC space as well. So I think it was a great demo uh, that the AWS team did on that. In the enterprise section, there was something called the reinvent your business with people and culture first and technology second. And I thought that was actually an interesting approach. And again, uh, obviously uh, focusing on people and culture uh, and kind of technology coming after that. Uh, the other talk in that uh, theme was uh, build your business case for the cloud. Uh, and also another one which I found useful was building the foundation for cloud governance. Uh, and uh, that was definitely uh, one to uh, actually look for if you are at this sort of uh, uh, you know, design level or at the architecture level or at the uh, C level maybe in your organization. In terms of migrations, there was one around SAP cloud migration uh, and modernization with AWS. And also there was one around migrating Microsoft workloads. Again, very interesting. Now there was, like I said, also other themes as well. So uh, some of those included IoT, security, storage, uh, well-architected uh, and many more. Okay, so I'm now with Aquasec, and we're going to be asking them some questions about security. Hello there, what's your name? Hi, my, na hi, my name is Ehai. Nice to meet you. And what's actually your role at uh, Aquasec? So I'm a solution architect um, based in the UK. So I cover um, some of the UK um, you know, implementations, yep. Excellent. So obviously one of the things that's really kind of been coming up over the last few years is vulnerabilities and security in the cloud and things like that. And specifically DevSecOps, there seems to be like a difference when you know people have always said talked about sort of DevOps in the you know in the past and now it's kind of more around DevSecOps. So can you just give us like a 30 second definition of what dev what DevSecOps actually means? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, DevSecOps is um, the intersection of development, um, ops and security. So, um, you know, it might sound intuitive, but what it is, is implementing security practices into the development and maintenance of your applications um, where they, wherever they run. So whether it's in the cloud, um, whether it's on-prem, just making sure that you're implementing security practices to make sure that you're deploying secure applications for your users. Um, and to us here at Aqua, we believe in securing applications um, in a native way to the, you know, the cloud that you're developing them for. Um, and this goes all the way from implementing security at the left, so as code, making sure that you build this securely, um, hardening your um, cloud um, accounts, your Kubernetes clusters that you deploy onto this, and um, making sure that at runtime these applications are protected because it's not just enough to see what's happening um, and see the risks. You also need to make sure that these applications are protected as they run. Excellent. Thanks very much for that. Appreciate your time. Now, the show isn't all business and no fun. The latter was certainly represented in many ways not just by the decent amount of swag that was available, but also by some of the more curious sections of the summit, such as the racing cars and the Deep Racer track. Deep Racer, hmm, that reminds me of the classic Ridge Racer video game. Anyway, what was the fun part for you and what did you learn? Please let me know in the comments section. Okay, so I'm here now with Splunk, and we're going to be talking about machine data and observability. And I have with me... Ismail Papa, uh, sales engineer at Splunk. Excellent. Nice to meet you, Ismail. So, uh, Ismail, let's uh, start with uh, a, a, a sort of a quick definition of what is machine data, please. 
Yeah, so machine data, if you want, and how we define it is any type of data that's being generated by systems. So that can be anything from uh, when you have a mobile and you are connecting to an application down to any uh, service that's being generated on the back end by uh, the application that's running uh, on uh, an, a company. And that's anything from data being generated by um, a car or an IoT devices uh, that leaves a trace of uh, what has happened and what's the status of this system. Excellent. So uh, that kind of leads us nicely on to sort of observability, because obviously that's kind of one of the ways to sort of look at machine data and, and sort of process and so on. So what does actually observability mean? Yeah, so observability is a term that's been around uh, recently uh, that has been uh, down to uh, differentiate with uh, monitoring and to say that monitoring was uh, on a simpler, less complex environment that we have now. And now with the explosion of data sources, different types of streams of, uh, of data, data also being inside of uh, the cloud and on premises, um, there, is, there needs to be a way to observe application in a different way. And this is where uh, you have three pillars for them and different data sources that range from traces, metrics, and logs. Uh, which uh, needs to be covered to observe the application in the correct way. Uh, last thing that I would say on observability is that um, a lot of applications are not observable, meaning that they, we are looking from them in, from the outside in, and what we want to do is looking from them from the inside out and getting those applications to be observable and have more KPIs and, and data that we can visualize. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. It's has been very useful to, to learn all that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for your time. Of course, us techies can work from anywhere. Who needs an office these days anyway? Hello, it's me again. So I'm here with JFrog and we're going to ask him some interesting questions. Hello there, Tal. How are you doing? Great, great. Tal, can you just uh, give us the uh, sort of details of what you do at uh, JFrog? Yeah, so I'm a solution engineer in a DevOps acceleration teams where I basically assist Jay for customers on their DevOps journey with us. Excellent. So one of the things that kind of confuses people a lot is really the kind of the difference between a code repository and an image repository. Can you give us like a 20 second, 30 second sort of just explanation of what's, what the difference is and what does that mean? Sure. So basically, we write our applications as a code, but we ship it as binaries. So in order to do it perfectly, we need to have some of a binary management platform where you can basically manage all different types of technologies. You mentioned Docker containers, but it's also Maven, Go, NPM, etc. So having one single source of truth for managing such platform is very important since we eventually ship our software as binaries, not as code. So that's the key part here. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sal. Appreciate you explaining that. Appreciate it. So the two key takeaways from the summit for me were AWS infrastructure services, how far this has come and how wide it is now, encompassing serverless, AI, ML solutions, and even ARM-based computing. Certainly the HPC demo by John Hammond and the rest of the team was quite impressive. So well done, John. Also, in the area of FinOps, the FinOps Foundation, which I'll hopefully be featuring on the channel in the near future, describes FinOps as being data-driven spending decisions through cloud financial management and disciplines. And certainly AWS continued its drive to offer savings uh, for clients by providing various tools and functions in this area to help its customers. I appreciate you may have a different view from me in terms of your key takeaways. Uh, so do let me know in the, um, in the comments section what your key takeaways were. Hello, well, I'm here with Gremlin, uh, and we're going to ask them some questions about chaos engineering. Hello, Jason, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent, so really appreciate you doing this for me. Uh, just really wanted to ask you, kind of give me a 30 second description of what chaos engineering is. Yeah, chaos engineering is the process of intentionally injecting failure into your systems to see how they really operate 
so that you can make them more resilient to actual incidents. Excellent. And why would why would enterprises want to do that? What are the benefits for like developers or companies that have critical systems doing that? What would be the benefit? Yeah, well, the benefit, as you mentioned, is critical systems. Our systems today are getting far more complex than they, they used to be. You know, we've adopted the cloud, we have services, we, we rely on so many other services, and that makes our systems more complex and more prone to failure. And so the advantage for developers is really being able to test your systems without having to experience the pain of an actual failure. So by simulating a failure, by injecting failure in a controlled way, you can proactively improve your reliability and then not have to experience a real outage or a real incident. Excellent. Well, that sounds like a really good strategy. Jason, I appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, it's certainly been an interesting summit. There's been lots of talks and demos and presentations and keynotes. I hope you enjoyed the coverage. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time.